Good evening, America. Welcome to your Friday edition of Just the News, No Noise. I'm your host, Amanda Head, reporting to you from Los Angeles, California. My amazing co-host, John Solomon, is planning to be back in action next week, which I am very excited for because it gets kind of lonely rattling around this big old show by myself, especially with the latest drama playing out up on Capitol Hill between Democrat Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and his fellow leftists refusing to try Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to the GOP-led House's internal fights and bickering over more funding to Ukraine without any taxpayer funds allocated to our own southern border. It seems as if Congress might, Congressman and Speaker Mike Johnson's speakership could be coming to an end. Now, despite former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, he's actually saying that he doesn't think it's going to happen. We'll see. We'll be diving into the latest issues, including Biden's recent stance on China with an all-star lineup. And in some other news that you might have missed, the state of California is suing the city of Huntington Beach over a new voter ID law passed by voters last month. Now, the city and respective county both passed election integrity measures for their jurisdictions that would require a voter to show identification in local elections beginning in 2026. However, the far-left executive branch and state legislature are showing their displeasure with the new law because the current law is that voters only need to present ID when they vote for the first time. Now, this is a classic case of one step forward and two steps back. But I know that Just the News' own Natalia Middlestad is going to be on the election integrity beat, and she's going to be following that case along. And happy birthday, Natalia, by the way. All right. In other underreported news headlines from this week include... Florida school students will be receiving instruction on the history of communism after new state legislation was signed into law. Governor DeSantis accused colleges of either rehabilitating communism uh -huh, or whitewashing it. Therefore, he wants to implement age-appropriate teaching lessons on the history of communism. That curriculum implementation will begin in the fall of 2026. And meanwhile, the liberal boomerang strikes again. Google has fired 28 employees involved in a protest against a contract with the Israeli government. The contract is a cloud computing deal with the Israeli government that Google shares with Amazon, according to reports. Now, these Googlers, who were part of a group called No Tech for Apartheid, were fired just a few days after being removed from the company's property after they participated in what they considered a sit-in protest at Google offices in Sunnyvale, California, and New York City. Too bad the production cast, crew, and actors are almost all mostly far leftist because the situation would make for a very great comedy. But while there is so much more to talk about, I can't leave my guests waiting, especially our first one of tonight, as I said at the top of the hour, the Senate's killing of the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has infuriated Republicans up on Capitol Hill and countless Americans across the country who continue to be enraged over the Biden administration's tolerance of the ongoing crisis at the southern border. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer urged his colleague to vote down both articles, calling the impeachment the least legitimate, least substantive, and most politi politicized impeachment trial ever in the history of the United States. And that's really funny because well, I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure I can think of at least one, maybe two other impeachment trials that had far less legitimacy. Not surprisingly, the White House celebrated the news, calling the trial baseless and unconstitutional. And my first guest tonight is one of those angry Republicans, but he's not on Capitol Hill, not at least yet. He's a candidate for U.S. Senate in Arizona and serves as the current sheriff of Pinal County. He's Mark Lamb, and he joins us now. Sheriff, thank you so much for joining the show tonight. Thank you, Amanda, for having me on. And you're right, I am one of those furious Americans with what's happening there. Yeah, and I just have to ask you because, you know, the, the House created these two articles. They marched them over to the Senate. I know that the hope was that there would at least be a trial to shed a little bit more light for the American people on his complete dereliction of duty and also, by the way, lying to Congress and the American people about the status of the border. Does this feel like a waste of time considering it was killed in the crib in the Senate? No, I don't think it was a waste of time. I think that the American people deserve to have him be impeached. He was by the House appropriately because he has failed in many ways. And I can I can tell you firsthand, this has caused some major problems for us. And not just me, sheriffs all across this country and law enforcement across this country. He has completely failed to do it. Now, I think we all knew 
what the Senate's outcome would be. But I think they had a responsibility to the American people to hear it and at least inter you know listen to the other side and why the House passed it up to them. I think every American should be angry with the Senate for not hearing it out and uh, should vote these people out. Look, it's part of the reason I'm running, because a lot of these issues are not going to be fixed on the county level. we got to fix them at the national level and hold these uh, bureaucrats and technocrats in D.C. accountable. He, he should have been held accountable and impeached. Yeah, well, you know, I, I guess it's up to journalism now to shed light on this, because obviously there's not going to be that information borne out in any type of trial in the Senate. But we just now learned that that 30 year old Haitian um, Canal Baptiste in Orange County, who was indicted on two counts of murder, two, and I think two counts of murder, one. Uh, he stabbed both of his roommates to death. He was processed less than a year ago and processed into the interior of the country via the CBP-1 app. And then, of course, the murderer of Lake and Riley, they, he was given a work permit, despite the fact that the Biden administration knew that he had a criminal record. These instances are just two examples that I think the American people need to know about, because I do think that it is affecting their vote, even if they're not, technic even if they're not historically tempted to vote for Donald Trump. What do you think? These are not isolated incidents, Amanda. You're exactly right. We right. should be holding them accountable, even if it was only these two. But the fact is, it's not going to be only these two. When you admit that you're only vetting about 5%, and it's not because Border Patrol is not trying to do their job. They're doing an amazing job under the circumstances that this administration has put them in. But it's because this administration has got them so buried in work, they're not able to vet everybody. Vetting about 5%, you've got to be naive to believe that more people, more criminals like this have not gotten through the, the, uh, the cracks. They absolutely have. I think it's only a matter of time before it continues to rear its ugly head. Yeah. Sheriff, um, there is a major concern about the influence in our elections of illegal aliens. There are I believe 44 states that have some form of motor voter laws. So if you can, if you get into the country and you register for a driver's license, you're automatically registered to vote. Is that a concern for you down in Arizona and, and obviously nationwide because you're running for a federal office? Yeah, we should be very concerned. I think we've lost a lot of trust in our government. But look, we should also not lose track of the fact that social media is interfering in elections. The courts, the lawfare, this government, New York, they're interfering with this this uh, election by going after President Donald Trump in the way that they have. Whether you like them or not, what you see is lawfare at its highest level. And Americans are being our elections are being interfered with on many levels, uh, up to and including people that may or may not be uh, citizens of this country potentially voting. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you about the China factor, because, you know, for, for a long time, the issue for our poorest border was uh, Hispanic illegal immigrants coming across the border. We know that that is not the case at all now. I mean, over 100 countries are represented at the border. Isn't that diversity wonderful? Um, but the increase in, in Chinese nationals coming across our border and Chinese fentanyl coming across our border. As you're out campaigning in the state of Arizona, um, I know that there are a lot of moms and dads out there and just people in general who have been directly affected by this, haven't they? They absolutely have. And I've been saying this on the campaign trail. Last year, 37,000 Chinese nationals, almost all military age men, came across our southern borders. This year, I think the number's already up to about 30,000. So by the time we hit October, uh, which is the end of the Border Patrol's year, we're going to be probably double what we were last year. You don't just get to leave a communist country. On many levels, that should be concerning. But let's take it a step further. I think the greatest threat to America, terrorist threat right now we're facing, is fentanyl poisonings. It looks very different than the, ter the terrorism we're used to seeing, like bombs going off or people firing guns or crashing planes into a building. The real terrorism that's killing Americans at a higher rate than anything else, better, more effective than any army, is fentanyl poisonings. What you're seeing right there is killing. It's become the leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 18 and 45, and it is killing about 100,000 Americans a year. And that comes from China. It is put into the hands of the cartels. They bring it in here, and it is, it is affecting Americans, causing fear in the hearts of American parents and families all across this country and it has become the most successful killer of Americans. Yeah, it's, it's, it's utterly heartbreaking, and I don't know if there are many Americans out there who aren't affected by it somehow. I want to ask you about the relationship 
what I can only imagine is probably a tense one between law enforcement like yourself in the state of Arizona and your Democrat governor. Um, obviously, your Democrat governor is not doing hardly anything to affect any type of fortification of the border. I think she tries to do uh, some superficial things, and she, she gives these real fighting words towards the Biden administration saying they're not doing enough. But we know that that's because she sees how bad the situation is, and it puts her political future in peril. With respect to what local law enforcement in Arizona can do to protect at least your own state border with Mexico, um, what can you do outside of, of what is allowable by your governor? Well, we're pretty tied because what's happening, you know, the, what there, what is a federal law is coming to this country illegally. We're seeing now Texas trying to, to push back and figure out where we, we can hold people accountable that have come into our states illegally, which Arizona did clear back in 2010, 2011, when we passed one of our laws here that was overturned by the Ninth Circuit. The reality is, is what we can do is send better people to Washington, people that understand this issue, that can fight it. I've been fighting it on the border. I've been fighting crime for almost two decades. Um, these are the type of experience we need now in Washington, D.C. And we've got to make sure that we elect elected officials on a local level, state legislators, state senators, that are going to do the best to protect our border as well. Because in many ways, those guys can bypass some of the stuff that the governor can do. So we really just need to make sure that we're electing really good people on a state level and let's send the right people back on a national level. It's a reason I'm running for the Senate because we need people with the right experience, true uh, proven conservative leaders and fighters that get, that are going to go back to D.C. and fight for the people. Amen. Amen. OK, let's talk about your campaign. I want to zoom in on that. I know that there were probably a lot of reasons that led to your decision to pull the trigger and run for office. Was 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 it immigration? Was there something in particular that really tipped you in that direction? Yeah, one of the things I wasn't interested, I was looking for reasons why not to do it. But then I when I tried <laughs> to charge my orcas for um, aiding and abetting and human trafficking in this country. And when I took it to our county attorney, ultimately because of the supremacy clause and case law, I wasn't able to do it. And I came home back in October of 2022. And I told my wife, you know what? I am interested in running now because these problems can't be fixed on a county level. We've got to get people like my orcas out. And the only way we do that is voting them out. Because clearly, as long as the Senate remains Democrat or the House, they're not going to hold these, these uh, technical Democrats and bureaucrats accountable. And so that was really kind of what got me going towards it. We had a personal tragedy in our family where we lost our children. Ulti you know, initially that was something that totally knocked me off the tracks. But eventually uh, what it taught us is there is no guarantee for tomorrow. And the only thing we take with us in this life is what we do. And so that personal tragedy also was probably the last thing that pushed us towards doing this. And uh, we love America. We're determined to be free. And I think a lot of Americans feel the same way. And I want to be their representative that's going to fight on in D.C. and not be beholden to any of those uh, party politics or the money. Yeah, I, I know your son and your grandchild who you lost in that accident are looking down there. Very proud of you. Very quickly, what's the website? SheriffLamb.com. Come visit us. Please support us. SheriffLamb.com. Very, very easy to remember. Everybody go check it out. Sheriff, I know you have a lot going on with your Senate campaign and running all over the state of Arizona. We appreciate you taking out the time to join us. We've got to take a very quick commercial break. We'll be back on the other side. Welcome back, everybody. The House Select Committee on the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, released a new report detailing an investigation that revealed the Chinese government is subsidizing the manufacturing and export of fentanyl materials. According to the report's findings, the government provides tax rebates to domestic companies that manufacture and export fentanyl. The disturbing news is that, is that that is just the latest example of how the CCP poses a national security threat to the United States. Of course, Identifying these problems is easier than actually determining the appropriate countermeasures from a foreign policy perspective. So fortunately for us, my next guest is one of the few people who is qualified to do just that. Michael Sabolik is the senior fellow in Indo-Pacific Studies for the American Foreign Policy Council. And he's the author of the new book, Countering China's Game, A Strategy for American Dominance. And he joins me now. Michael, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the book launch. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's been a pleasure to publish a book, but the, the topic, sadly, is kind of weighty. 
<laughs> Indeed it is, and it's historic. I mean, this is something that we have dealt with for a very long time. And now that Joe Biden is in office, there's obviously a history there, uh, confusing, albeit history, uh, of Joe Biden and his relationship with China and his treatment of China, his connections to China. Tell us about your book, though. So the, the premise of countering China's great game is that the United States is in a Cold War with the Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Party and that America is losing that Cold War. I wrote the book because I worked in the U.S. Senate for five years. And during that time, I noticed that our elite political institutions though they were beginning to understand the threat that Beijing poses to America, a lot of our policies were really reactive. We, we were growing aware of Beijing's malign influence inside of America, of all the ways that U.S. companies are hopelessly entangled with the market inside of China. But we weren't really going on the offensive against the Chinese Communist Party. We weren't trying to find the CCP's weaknesses and exploit them. And we, we just haven't been serious about winning this second Cold War that we find ourselves in. And I wanted to write a blueprint for American policymakers, not just to compete to balance against China or to survive, but to win. And that's the goal of the book. If you had to narrow it down to just two tactics for the United States to exert dominance over China to exploit those weaknesses, what would those be? I think that if you trace back the party's weaknesses, you're not just going to look at their foreign policy around the world, although that's part of it. You're going to look at how the Chinese Communist Party governs China, how the party stays in power. And let's face it, it's easy to think that a lot of dictatorships are really strong because they wield power in a way that democracies don't. But Tyrants and despots rule the way they do, not because they're secure, but because they're afraid of their own people. And once you understand that, you begin to notice some competitive advantages that free countries like America have over dictatorships like the People's Republic of China. And two examples of that are the human rights realm and the information realm. With human rights, uh, China is committing a genocide against Uyghur Muslims inside of their own country in Xinjiang. They've been doing that for seven years. And a lot of the commercial traffic that runs through that region of the genocide uses the US dollar to trade. Now, maybe it's just me, but I don't think the US government should allow foreign countries that are committing genocide for economic reasons to use the US dollar to do that. That's just unacceptable. So one of the competitive uh, policies I recommend in the book is and impose limitations on China's ability to do that. The second, with information, if you have a regime like the CCP that has to censor every single critical piece of information because they're deathly afraid of the Chinese people and freedom of speech, let's exploit that. Let's make it harder and more expensive for China to control information within its own borders. And if you do that, they can't be as belligerent or aggressive abroad because they have too many problems at home to deal with. Yes. Um and, and I've been to China, and when you are allowed to have conversations with Chinese people on the ground, and you're allowed to tell them what the rest of the world looks like, it's quite, it's quite a remarkable thing to witness when they realize that they have been, unfortunately, living in a government-imposed bubble. I want to ask you about something that I've been freaked out for a little while. Not freaked out for myself personally, but for TikTok users, because um, Susie Loftus, who is the head of trust and safety for TikTok as far as U.S. data security, accidentally let the cat out of the bag and admitted to the fact that some user data is stored in China. And we know that one of those ways that the CCP controls their people is through social credit scores and facial recognition. Considering they have U.S. user data being stored in China, does China actually have social credit scores and facial recognition for American citizens? So the, the problem with TikTok is so multifaceted. You're touching on a huge issue, which is the data privacy, or maybe more accurately, the compromised data privacy of Americans. Uh, there's a report that just came out a few days ago that said that TikTok employees in the United States every two weeks or so had to send U.S. data information to China regularly at their request and they could not say no. So data security is a huge issue. Uh, another one that, that has me particularly really concerned with TikTok is disinformation. 
you have roughly 170 million Americans on TikTok. That's about half the population of the United States. A large portion of that 170 million U.S. users of TikTok are on the app regularly and at least an hour a day. You have more and more Americans turning to TikTok for news. This is an app that is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. It's algorithm. It's highly sophisticated algorithm that boosts content and suppresses and censors content is controlled by Beijing. We have one of the most powerful social media apps in America in the death grip of our greatest geopolitical adversary. And it, it doesn't take that much imagination to think of a geopolitical scenario. Maybe it's a war over Taiwan where the CCP leverages TikTok to sow discord, disinformation, and to divide Americans at a critical juncture and to weaken our democracy when it needs to be strongest. It's a huge problem for us as Americans. And thankfully, Congress is in the process of trying to fix it. And I really hope they do. I hope so, too. And, you know, I made kind of a flippant remark at the top of this segment, but it's a very serious question. Um, is Biden compromised by his previous relationship from abroad, including those that his family, you know, has possibly had with with foreign businesses, including connected to the CCP? Uh, listen, I, I think President Biden is misguided when it comes to how he approaches China. From day one of his administration, he has insisted that the United States can both cooperate and compete with the Chinese Communist Party at the same time. That's a Pollyannish belief. It is not based in reality, and it's naive. The Chinese Communist Party is not trying to do that. The Chinese Communist Party is trying to win a Cold War. And if you look at the high-level diplomatic overtures that the Biden administration has repeatedly sent to Beijing over and over and over again, they have tried to secure th these dialogues at the expense of holding the party, the Chinese Communist Party, accountable for its worst behavior. Just look at the spy balloon last year. They tried to cover up the spy balloon's existence in America, and when they couldn't cover it up, they lied about it because they wanted the Secretary of State to keep his trip to China yeah. on schedule. He fundamentally is getting China wrong on that matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's exemplary of why they targeted Biden to begin with many years ago with elite capture. Um, but it's, it's devastating to see the effects on our country. Michael, so many books have been written about the threat China poses to the U.S., but I think this is going to be a fantastic one. Everybody, go check it out. And I'm excited to read your book, Michael, and I appreciate you. If you owe back taxes, fair warning, you're not going to like this. The IRS is mailing millions of pay-up letters, millions. Then it's up to the 20,000 new IRS enforcement agents to find you. Why the IRS targets you and not millionaires? Well, that's easy, because millionaires have tax lawyers. You don't. You'll pay up, plus interest and penalties. You need Tax Network USA, and you need them now. Tax Network USA has a brilliant war room strategy to solve your IRS problems quickly and in your favor. Like a preferred direct line to the IRS, they know which agents to deal with and who to avoid. It's not all bad news for you, because Tax Network USA learned of a special limited time IRS offer. The IRS is willing to waive $1 billion in penalties if you qualify Schedule your free confidential consultation to see if you qualify for this limited time IRS penalty canceling offer. Call 1-800-245-6000. That's 1-800-245-6000. Or visit tnusa.com slash just news. Or call 1-800-245-6000. Welcome back. In the wake of the Senate's killing of the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on Wednesday, a new poll released this week from the Heritage Foundation has proved to be extremely timely. The poll reveals how moderate voters in swing states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, feel about more of their hard-earned hard taxpayer dollars going to Ukraine Instead of our southern border, in what could be a harbinger for November, the survey found that three out of four of these moderate voters in those swing states would be opposed to a proposal that sent more funding to Ukraine and did not include funding to secure the southern border. So here to break down the polling and more is the Heritage Foundation's Director of Media and Public Relations, Noah Weinrich. Noah, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Amanda. We're happy to have you. And, you know, I want to dig in on these because we, we are talking about swing state voters at this point. So this is not 
you know, Arkansas or Tennessee or Oklahoma or, or even, you know, California, California or New York on the other end of the, of the spectrum. These are swing state voters that, that, as the name implies, they'll swing the election. And 75, 76%, I think, um, think that the Ukraine war should not be funded if there isn't more funding for the southern border. That's incredible, because if you listen to Democrats on Capitol Hill, they would have you believe that the southern border is not an issue. That's exactly right. And if you listen to uh, folks on both sides of the aisle, unfortunately, they would have you believe that Ukraine is our most pressing issue, that funding Ukraine's right. border is more important than funding the southern border. So there's a bill up in the House this week to fund the border of Ukraine. It would also fund Israel, Gaza, and Taiwan. Um, it would actually dedicate funding to Ukraine's border, 300 million, but nothing for the southern border. And so three quarters of swing voters that we polled said this was a bad idea. Um, and even if you take the border out of the picture, 56% think that we have already given too much to Ukraine. We've given them 113 billion. You know, these folks are trying to pay their gas, groceries, and rent. They cannot afford another $500 per household, which is what this bill would do, over to Ukraine. Now, I wonder if there is a growing sentiment across the entire political spectrum of just war fatigue in general, because obviously after 9-11, I think Americans in whole cloth felt like something had to be done. There had to be a response. There had to be uh, some type of punishment exacted for the thousands of Americans who were lost on that day. But it's been pretty perpetual since then. Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, and, and the list goes on and on of these conflicts, not necessarily publicized, that have been happening for the better part of the last 20 years. Does it seem to you that with respect to our involvement in Ukraine, that it's specifically Ukraine or that Americans are just sick of being involved globally in general? I think you're exactly right. That's a great observation. You know, Americans are tired of war. Um, and now this doesn't mean that they're anti-Ukraine, as some on the right, right and left would claim. You know, they support Ukraine. They believe that Ukraine was invaded unjustly. But that doesn't mean that America has to be involved or that America has to carry the weight. You know, Europe should be involved. They see a conflict. We're in over two years now into this and it's a mess and it's a stalemate and there's no way out. Biden is asking for more money, but he's not presenting a solution. He's not presenting a conclusion. He's not presenting a strategy. So instead of peace through strength, which is what we had um, under President Trump and President Reagan, we have war with weakness. Um, President Biden could not tell you how he's going to end the war in Ukraine, even if you give him $200 billion, which is what they're trying to do now. This would bring us up close to $200 billion. Um, now, President Trump, there were no new wars started under him, which was a record that was the first in several decades. And under President Biden, uh, you've seen conflicts break out in Iran, uh, Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan is under threat now. And so no matter how much money you throw at the problem, unless you have a strong leader, you are never going to see peace again. Absolutely. And I want to ask you about this bill that that literally as we speak is being considered because Freedom Caucus Chairman Bob Good tweeted out some language language regarding this bill. They proposed three hundred million dollars in, quote, international narcotic narcotics control and law enforcement, basically for Ukraine's border, nothing for our border. And there was a, a clever person on Twitter who actually went a little further to break down down these numbers. It's seven hundred and thirty dollars from every single American to do this for Ukraine, how nice, and not at our southern border. That's exactly right. You know, instead of America first, this truly is America last. We're sending money to uh, <laughs> at least four countries abroad and nothing for American soldiers or border enforcement here at home. Um, you know, they could put HR2 into this package. That is the strong America first border provision that was passed by the House last year, but they're not doing that which I think shows you that unfortunately, uh, they're not sticking to their commitment of um, putting the border first and putting Americans first. Um, we're gonna see a vote on this on Saturday. I think you're gonna see Americans from the left or the right in the middle speak out and say, look, we're tired of this. We're tired of the Uniparty in DC voting to fund wars abroad without a clear uh, strategy of how we bring them to a close. Um, and I think you're seeing this in country, in states across the country that Americans are just tired. You know, They may not be political, um, they may not vote every year, but they are tired of war and they're tired of chaos and they're tired of seeing their gas bills go up every year because of conflict in foreign countries. Yeah, it's incredible. And I know I know at the Heritage Foundation, you guys also kind of take an overview look at what is happening policy wise, specifically, I guess, in this conversation with respect to foreign policy. 
And I look at the visits by foreign leaders to Donald Trump, not Joe Biden. You had Polish President Duda uh, within the last week. You had Viktor Orban from Hungary visiting Donald Trump, not Joe Biden at the White House. What does that tell? First of all, what does that tell the world about who they consider to be the leader in America? And what does it tell Joe Biden? I think it's very significant. And we were proud to host um, Prime Minister Orban at the Heritage Foundation. The two stops he made that week were not to President Biden, but to the Heritage Foundation and to President Trump. And we loved having him. Uh, so I think it tells you that leaders abroad do not see Biden as the real power in America. Um, they do not see Biden as a real ally. And uh, the our ambassador to Hungary has been incredibly aggressive and anti-Hungary, even though they are a NATO ally and one of the few countries in Europe that's doing something about problems like immigration. Um, and so I think it pre it presents a picture abroad of weakness. Our leader is not respected, unfortunately. We wish he were. We wish America were, were respected. Um, but I think it shows you that there is also a growing international consensus. There are all these countries that are realizing that the globalist agenda has to end. It's hurting their countries. Uh, they need to put their countries first, just as we put America first. And so we're proud that in Argentina, um, in Spain, Italy, in Hungary, there is a growing conservative um, and nationalist uh, revolution, frankly, that's uh, the first encouraging sign that we've seen in Europe in probably decades. I love it. I, I love to see other nations putting their country first. I'm not offended by it in the least because every country should always put themselves first. Very quickly Absolutely. before we let you go, I know the Heritage Foundation, you guys broke a, uh, a story about an NGO in Mexico encouraging illegal immigrants to vote Biden once they get here. Tell us about it. That's right. The Oversight Project, which is one of the most exciting projects here at the Heritage Foundation, um, they found a flyer at an NGO um, down on the southern border. Uh, this is one of those places that um, brings in and houses illegals and helps them get into the country. Um, you can see there on the screen there was a flyer and the translation um, effectively says vote for Biden, because if you don't vote for Biden and President Trump wins, then um, all this will be over. Um, <laughs> And so it's amazing that they're uh, that they're sending this to illegals. Now, the NGO denies that they're the ones who put it there, but they have not answered the sure. question of who put it there, why is it there, and why isn't this being investigated? Gosh, it almost sounds like a government-organized, non-government organization, otherwise known as a gonga, which is really, really not great for our country. Noah, thank you so much for being here. I loved digging into this poll. Fantastic numbers, really, really interesting. We appreciate you being here. We'll have you back on soon. All right, everybody, we're going to take another quick commercial break, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Welcome back, America. The United States preeminent military has long been a source of comfort to Americans, but wasteful spending in recent years has eroded much of that sense of security. Two videos showing Florida Congressman Matt Gates and Michael Waltz grilling Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall went viral on social media this week, and it underscores my exact point. Take a look at these two clips. The F-35 is our signature Air Force platform. What percentage of them are fully mission capable today? Mr. Secretary. Congressman, if you give me a second, I'm going to pull out my card and give you an exact answer. Okay. Happy to. Your, your eyes are probably better than mine. Fifty-five percent is the number we have for avail operational availability. Full operationally capable. Fifty-five percent for is operational that, availability. Do you think that's a good number or a bad number? I think that's not a good number. This bag of bushings, stamped out by machinists, don't need a high, don't need a you know, need a high school uh, uh, diploma. It's not not anything high tech about this. All of this bag is compliant with the FAA specifications. How much do you think the Air Force pays for this bag of bushings? I don't know, Congressman. $90,000. Oh my gosh, $90,000 bushing bags and 55% of our fleet of inactive fighter jets of our F-35s, unbelievable. And this is on top of the Pentagon failing their sixth straight audit last year. My next guest is a veteran and a state elected official and I'm confident that he's going to have some sort of reaction to all of this. Tom Barrett is a former state senator and current candidate for Michigan's 7th Congressional District. Tom, welcome back, sir. Amanda, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate that. And you're exactly right um, in your intro, just the 
absolute critical readiness crisis we have in the military right now cannot be understated in the challenge that we're facing today. And, and Tom, you know, I, I feel like for most of my life, as I said at the top, there is a comfort in the strength of our military, in the competence of our military. That competence is seeming much more like incompetence these days. Is this, is this just a cancer that keeps growing in our armed forces? Well, I think it's a cancer that is really at the top of the chain of command. It goes all the way up to Joe Biden, yeah. our commander in chief who presided over the worst disaster in American military history with the withdrawal of Afghanistan, where we forfeited uh, you know, billions of dollars in equipment, but more significant than that, the lives of the 13 service members who were lost on that day during that withdrawal that was overseen by Joe Biden. And then his own Pentagon chain of command tried to tell us that this was some kind of massive success, uh, the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. There was that drone strike a few days later that we later learned blew up a carload of children, uh, which they tried to double down and tell us was a success. So this lack of candor and the lack of seriousness about our warfighter skills and our warfighter posture in the military is something that is absolutely dire right now. We have a recruiting problem in the military, we have a retention problem, and we have a readiness problem. And these are all because of Joe Biden and the senior leadership that he's appointed to these positions that have simply lost the trust of the American people. I retired from the Army two years ago in large part because of the failure of leadership of Joe Biden and decided to run for Congress to stand up to Biden and really bring about a course correction in our military. It's a major part of why I'm running. People can see my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, to see a little bit more about that and with my history. And it's a huge part of my platform for why I'm running for Congress. Yeah, and, and thank you for pointing that out because off, it, it's not the rank and file. It's never the rank and file of a police department, of the military, of the FBI. It's the brass at the top that create that culture. It's a top-down culture. Um, I wanted to ask you about the money side of things because if somebody is reckless with their spending but it's their money, you know, I hate to see it, but I don't care. It's not my money. $90,000 for bushing bags, that's my money. That's your money. The people who are watching this program, that's their money too. And I know you signed the Taxpayer Protection Pledge. Tell us about that. Yes. On tax day, just a couple of days ago, I stood at the federal building in Lansing, Michigan, the heart of the district where I'm running for Congress, to sign publicly the Taxpayer Protection Pledge that uh, makes a commitment to the people of my district, but also the people of the United States of America, that I am not going to support any type of tax increase and increased burden on them. Like you said, our government has become far too reckless with the resources that we have. We're undisciplined about how we've spent the people's money at the, at the federal government level, and we need to bring that discipline back. We need to provide value for the tax money that is being sent. Right now, we've betrayed the trust of Americans with the amount of resources and the amount of spending that we're sending to Washington, D.C. We don't have a secure border. We don't have safe communities. We're overspending on failed priorities. Here in Michigan, there was just a story in the Detroit News a couple of weeks ago about a state program where a, a, a state grant was issued to a nonprofit entity that bought a $4,500 coffee maker. So we simply have lost the trust of the American people in our government. We need to bring that trust back and it starts with fiscal discipline and it starts with a robust, capable military as well. Absolutely. Um, but all of these conversations that we are having don't matter at all unless there is election integrity. You are running in the state of Michigan, which let's face it, has had some pretty dastardly election integrity issues. Uh, heading into November, do, what, what grade would you give the improvement that has happened in Michigan? Uh, you know, A, F, anywhere in between? Yeah, I will say that we have done a far better job as, um, as candidates and through election uh, efforts to raise awareness around this and to recruit people who can be precinct uh, captains, uh, poll observers, poll challengers, people who are interested in that, who live in Michigan, again, can go to my website, TomBarrettForCongress.com, sign up as a volunteer. We'd be happy to train you in that effort. I sponsored a couple of different election integrity bills while I was in the state legislature. One was passed and signed into law that requires clerks in Michigan to issue paper ballots instead of those touchscreen tablets that you see in some states that are questionable on whether or not there's a paper trail behind that. So in Michigan, you must have a paper ballot to vote. 
But I also sponsored the voter ID legislation that passed the state legislature, but was sadly vetoed by Governor Whitmer. And not a single Democratic lawmaker would vote to override Governor Whitmer's veto of that. We found that 70 or 80 percent of Michiganders support common sense voter ID laws where people show an ID card to cast their ballot, to demonstrate their identity. The only demographic of people we could find that did not support voter ID legislation in Michigan were elected Democratic officials. So this is something that's a work in progress that we're going to continue to have to do. But we need volunteers who can help uh, man the effort to make sure that we have actual verification of individuals when they show up to vote, whether that's by mail, through early in-person voting that is going on in Michigan now for the first time ever, or on election day, all of which are important. And we have to make sure that people trust the integrity of these elections. Hmm. Imagine that, having to prove that you're a U.S. citizen and that you are who you are to vote. I can't imagine that yeah. not being the mentality. Yes. Um, I want to ask you about, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say at a time right now of crisis, we're in the United States, Joe Biden has presided over record breaking number of illegal border crossings into our country. We've now had over nine million illegal border crossings, which is almost equivalent to the entire population of the state of Michigan. So, yeah, having some, you know, verification of identity when you show up to vote is critically important right now. Sadly, that was vetoed here in Michigan, but we still have to make sure we have robust checks in place. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought that up because I want to ask you about the dichotomy between Joe Biden's immigration and Donald Trump's immigration. You being on the ticket there in Michigan, presumably with Donald Trump, as he you know, becomes the official nominee this summer, is that helpful to you? Yes, President Trump is, uh, is certainly well ahead of uh, Joe Biden in the polls here in Michigan. He's also ahead here in the district where I'm running. People in this district, I can't speak for the entire state, but people in the district, in the 7th Congressional District in Michigan, are sick and tired of Biden's failed border policies. We recently conducted a poll here where border security and immigration concerns were the number one issue for voters in this district. And it's so easy to see why we have two different contrasted views with how we deal with our border. One engages in border security and has a very rigid process by which people can enter our country. The other is completely lax. Joe Biden is the yep. first president in history to unsecure our border, and we can't allow that to continue. Law and order versus complete lawlessness. It's the wild, wild west on steroids. Tom, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Everybody check out his campaign and best luck to you, Tom, as you're out there campaigning in the beautiful Great Lakes state. All right, we have, we have to take one final commercial break, but we'll be right back. Welcome back for the final time on this fine Friday evening. Now, the city of Washington, D.C. had more homicides, great, in 2023 than any year since 1997, with 274 people killed, including 19 children. And while certain parts of the city are more dangerous than others, Violent crime is now breaking out in affluent areas like the Navy Yard neighborhood. A video from a Navy Yard resident racked up hundreds of thousands of views on X this week as it showed the ransacking of a CVS store. To talk more about this and the latest going on up on Capitol Hill, I'm joined now by Republican strategist Nasa Woomer, who lives in D.C. Nasa, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I'm happy to have you. And look, we're both you know, white ladies walking around, petite little ladies walking around Washington, D.C. Do you feel safe? Absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane because I actually live in the upper northwest part of Washington, D.C., bordering Georgetown. And it's just watching crime escalating into these parts of D.C. is, you know, absolutely concerning to a lot of people. And I have friends who have moved out of not just Washington, D.C., but even out of just the Navy Yard by itself, because they want to feel more safer. They're heading into, they're crossing the Potomac and going into Virginia, just feel a little bit more safer and would rather deal with, you know, an extra 30 minutes of a commute time versus um, their own personal safety. And it's just really unfortunate to see that, you know, Mayor Bowser has enough time to go watch Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson play golf at the Masters, which I would love to do. But uh, but nothing's being done. And even the attorney general had put out um, a press release on Thursday afternoon just stating the same word salad that it just seems, you know, we're, 
no real consequences for the actions of those who are committing these crimes. Yeah, it, it, it's devastating to see. Do you think, Nasa, that there is a saturation point where the chickens have come home to roost so much so with respect to crime that the mayor finally decides to do something? She finally decides to to not hamstring D.C. police. Is, is there a point at which that can happen? Oh, that's actually a really good question, but it boils back down to, you would think that would have happened last, I believe it was last summer when um, President Biden's own granddaughter um, had, right. you know, she had, I think it was a, it was a break in, in Georgetown. And I think even other, um, other reporters, including people like Luke Russert, who have, you know, tweeted out, is this where we have finally gotten to, to raise the alarm? Because this is now the president's granddaughter. And if the president's granddaughter is being carjacked, you would think that would be the real wake up call. But unfortunately, still nothing is being done. Unreal. And I just heard from one of the guys in our control room that his car got stolen and then was used to <gasps> exact, uh, I think, an armed robbery. So that's fun. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. I want to switch gears. So I know. <laughs> Very timely, huh? I know. right? Uh, OK. You, yeah. You, so you served as a communications director up on the Hill. So I just have to to get your perspective and your opinion on what is happening with Speaker Johnson. I think that a lot of people were hopeful at the beginning of his tenure. And he's had a major fallout with the Freedom Caucus and seems mm -hmm. to be moving in directions he promised he would go the opposite. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, you cannot keep the Freedom Caucus happy, no matter who you put in. You could be as extremely conservative as Speaker Johnson or as, in some cases, as I wouldn't want to say moderate about um, former Speaker John Boehner, but it's just nothing will ever please them. And we are in the slimmest of slim majorities right now. And he has to be able to, meaning Speaker Johnson, has to be able to work with Democrats on certain things. And I will, I actually, I he had recently spoken to the media and gave a real, I would say that respect a very respected statement just saying he's not fearing um, if the motion to vacate does go through, he's trying to do the right thing. And he's looking at this as a leader and as a speaker. And one of the things that I recognize is that, you know, we, you know, you may not agree on everything that he's trying to do, but the most important thing is he's recognizing that there is a real existential crisis going on in Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan, and we need to be stepping up to the plate. And even um, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sent a joint letter, and I'm blanking on who the other the other individual was, but they're supporting um, Speaker Johnson in this effort. And and quite frankly, if they do, if this motion to vacate does pass, um, it's just going to be another final nail in the coffin for House Republicans uh, to secure the House um, after the 2024 election. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to use the term that I want to, but they something away their majority. And uh, now it's yes. unpicking. <laughs> All right. I want to shift gears to Senator John Fetterman, who uh, I thought was really progressive, and I think he is in a lot of areas, but he seems to be Captain Common Sense now. He recently called Senator Menendez a sleazeball after reports show that he will blame his wife for hiding information. I think sleazeball is actually the exact word I would use, Nasa. I would think a little bit more than sleazeball, but, you know, trying to be <laughs> diplomatic here. Yeah. Um, again, this is back to the 2024 bingo uh, political a political bingo card that I never thought John Fetterman would be on in, in terms of a positive. Um, he's doing exactly what, um, in a way, you know, let's go back to even my former boss, George Santos, where House Republicans were actually, you know, put forth the um, expulsion of him. And John Fetterman is trying to do the same thing with Senator Menendez, whose crimes are far worse. And the fact that, um, and I hate to say this, but in the marriage vows of for better or for worse, I think Menendez has taken it to the next level of the for worse part, if he isn't truly going to, um, yeah. uh, you know, blame his wife and throw her under the bus just so he can right. get away with it. So. I feel like when he took those vows for better or worse, he meant for himself better and for his <laughs> wife worse. I don't think that that's the, the, the spirit of the agreement, but it's whatever. Bobby Goldbars. So. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Bobby Goldbars. I love that. Nasa, such a joy having you on. Thank you so much. We appreciate your perspective. As All always, right, everybody. Thank that's you. it for us. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks for tuning in this week. John's going to be back next week, but be sure to tune into my podcast, Furthermore, with Amanda Head on Apple, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays on Spotify.